Take your Bibles and turn to Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes. A few people in my life keep pointing out that I'm saying it wrong. It's not Ecclesiastes, it's Ecclesiastes, apparently. Yeah, the, the syllable, I keep messing it up. So um, it's like, say again? Tomato, tomato, it's fine. Well, you know, I strive for biblical accuracy. It's like when I first met my wife, I called her Teresa, and her name is Theresa. And to this day, I still end up calling her Teresa, when her name is Theresa. Got to get that T-H in there. So Ecclesiastes chapter 3. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I was tempted to ask um, Scott Finch if he would pull out a rendition of... Um, uh, an old 60s song uh, sung by, what, what's their name, the, the band? I can't remember. I know it was written by Pete Seeger, and then it was the Birds. That's right, and they, they sang the song Turn, you know? Some of you that are children of the 60s are familiar with that song. Uh, it's actually built off this text. And what's interesting is that they changed just a few words and made millions off of it. Um, but it's, it's all built on uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 through 8. And this is a, a beautiful text. We're actually going to read verse 1 down to verse number 15. And we'll be looking um, at this over the next two weeks, actually. Uh, and you'll see why in a moment. It's hard to get all the truth out of here that's laden within. But um, I, I, I file this under the text uh, that I wish someone preached when I was in my early 20s. You know, when I was, was kind of just thinking about life more deeply. You know, before then, I was interested in partying and just having a good time. But some, something about when you hit your 20s, you begin to think more deeply about life. And I wish someone had preached or counseled me through this text, because this text has a lot of blessed reminders about the seasons in our life. So that's... Pay attention now to God's holy and inspired word. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, C's, C's, chapter 3, verse 1 through 15. I'll get it right in heaven. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under, under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it, so that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. Well, all flesh is as grass and the glory of man as 
the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord shall endure forever. And this is the word that will be taught unto you. Amen and amen. Now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Our Father, this is your word and these are your people. They have come here to hear from you and I pray that might be the case. Lord, your word is beautiful. It reminds us of glorious truths, but not only that, it shapes and molds our hearts that we think more heavenly than earthly, that we think in ways that build us up and not tear us down, that we learn to have the mind of Christ and not the mind of this world. And so now my, my prayer is that you might bless us, and you have already through the singing, through the reading of scripture, and now as we partake of your word and later of the supper, may you shape and mold us more into the image of your son. And so now, Father, what we ask not, teach us. What we have not, give us. And what we are not, make us by the power of of your blessed Holy Spirit, and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. As I mentioned earlier, um, this text is about the seasons in our life. And all of us go through seasons. In the same way, we have four seasons, um, maybe in North Georgia, three and a half. Um, There are seasons in our own life. All of us right now are going through a season. Our lives are seasonal. There's some of you that are going through a season of being in school, and some of you are going through the season of raising children. Some of you are going through the season of being empty nesters. Some of us in this room are going through the season of leaving Mississippi and starting a new job in North Georgia and coming to a new church for a first time. We won't mention any names. But all of us in this room are experiencing seasons. That's the point of verse 1 through 8. He's making observations about the seasons in our life, that our lives are seasonal. But let me say that anyone can make these observations. That's in verse 1 through 8. That's not special. What is special is what he does in verse 9 through 15, and that's gives us great wisdom to navigate the seasons in our lives. And Solomon actually gives us four, four of them, four thoughts, four pieces of wisdom that help us navigate the seasons in our lives. Now, because these are so important, I'm going to do two this week, and then I'm going to do two next week. And I want you to ponder these because these are Very profound. And the two that I want to give you today are these. The first thing um, Solomon observes about the seasons in our lives is God limits our control of the seasons in our lives that we might learn to trust him. God limits our control of the seasons in our lives that we might trust him. And the second is this, that God limits our understanding of the seasons in our lives, specifically the present that we might look to him for answers. Those are the two things that Solomon says here. So let's look at it. First of all, God limits our control over the seasons in our lives that we might learn to trust him. Notice verse 9 through 11. Solomon says, What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the busyness that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Now what Solomon says in verse number 9 is pretty profound. And I want you to pay close attention to it. In verse number 9, Solomon saying that most people have a view of life that tends towards dualism. They look at life as either good things and bad things that are happening to them. Notice uh, in verse 1 through 8, Solomon says if there was a ledger of some sort or if there was an Excel, Excel spreadsheet... On one side of that, we'll have all the good things that happen to us in life. And on the other side, we would have all the negative or bad things that happen to us in our lives. And Solomon says in verse number 9, if we view life like that, then what gain is life to us? 
If we look at this list and we say, well, it's good to be born, but not good to die. It's good to plant, but it's not good to be planted, or, or in reverse. Or it's, it's bad to kill, but it's, it's uh, good to heal. If we, if we have this vision of life, Solomon says, it will lead to depression. It'll actually lead to disillusionment and frustration and emptiness. That if we look at life as simply the good things that happen to us and the bad things that happen to us, then we'll miss the point of life. In verse number 9, he says that there are people who view life like this, and you know those people. They view life as just simply good or bad. And if good things happen to them, they'll say, well, I'm having a good day or a good life. Or if more bad things happen to them, they'll say, well, you know, my life is not going so well right now. I'm having a bad time of it. Good and bad. That's how they view life. And, Paul, uh, and uh, Solomon says here, if that's how we view life, then we will be miserable, ultimately. And so is that how you view life? Simply as good and bad? Do you know people that view life like that? Solomon is saying that's not good. In fact, Solomon then pushes us to see that there's a better way to view life. Not simply as good and bad things, but things that work together for the good of God. You say, Pastor Dennis, how do you know that? Well, look at verse number 11. He forces us to have a heavenly perspective. He said, um, and he, meaning God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Everything is beautiful in its time. So what is he saying? He's saying that there's a time to die that's beautiful. There's a time to die that's beautiful. There's a time when things are cast away, and that's a beautiful time. Everything that God does on this list I know some of us look at this list and we might see all the good things and those are the things that we want. And then we see negative things and we think we don't want those things. But, but what, uh, what Solomon is saying here is that God uses both or all of these things, all 14 of these uh, couplets as good and beautiful things in the life of each and every one of us. Because he's doing something glorious in us and through us. And so birth and death works together. And planting and plucking up works together. And killing and healing works together in our lives. And it's a beautiful thing. I remember uh, this point came home to me at my brother's wedding. I was best man in my brother's wedding. And it it was a good time. You know what I realized with being a best man? You end up being the gopher. Whatever they want, you go and get. And I remember my brother looking at me and he's saying, hey, I need you to get a message to someone. And I said, sure. And I, I went looking for this person. And, and here's the point. Uh, you know, we were in a big building and it had lots of things going in and out of it, lot, lots of corridors and lots of little rooms. And I'm frantically going in and out of the little room to find the person that he wants me to find. And, and I'm looking and I'm searching and I go into this room And when I walked into the room, lo and behold, it's the room where the bridal party is getting ready. Now, let me say two things real quick. Number one, I saw nothing inappropriate. I was in the room for about 30 seconds. But number two, I want to say, uh, it looked like a construction site. (laughs) There was duct tape and glue and something that looked like brick and mortar. And people were being stapled and turned around. And I couldn't believe it. And I stood there for 30 seconds thinking to myself, my goodness, is this what it looks like? And so I rushed out of the room, I think. Nobody saw me, and I closed the door. And I remember thinking to myself, there is no way these women are going to get dressed in an hour. It's just not going to happen. And so we, we went into the, the sanctuary or the place that they have where the wedding was going to take place. And, and we, the, the men lined up and then the women began to come down this aisle. And wouldn't you know it, one by one, they looked beautiful. Each and every one of them. They looked absolutely beautiful. They looked stunning, in fact. You couldn't see the duct tape or the glue. You didn't know they had extensions on. 
You didn't know they had fake nails on. You didn't see any of the brick and mortar that went into making them look beautiful. But when they walked down the aisle, they were beautiful. And so what, what is Solomon saying here? Solomon is saying, yes, I know your life might look like a construction site. I know you wake up on certain days and you think, wow, this doesn't look beautiful. But you see, we need to have an eternal perspective that, that God is making everything beautiful in his time. And even though you might be going through some things that, that just don't look beautiful, in fact, you would even say, Dennis, it's pretty messy right now. Hold on. God has what we call a telos in mind. What is that? Well, telos is the Greek word to mean aim or plan. That God is trying to accomplish something in and through you. In Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, uh, Paul says it like this. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word. And notice what Paul says here in verse number 27. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it might be holy and without blemish. Notice those words. In splendor, without spot or wrinkle, holy and without blemish. What is he saying? It's God's job to make us beautiful. He's making you beautiful. And you know what? You don't have any control over that. That everything that you see happen in this list, the keeping and the casting away, the love and the hate, the war and the peace, the silence and the time to speak, all of those things work together to make you beautiful. And the question that I have for you this morning is this, do you have enough faith to believe that that's true? Do you have enough faith to see God working in your life, both in the good and in the bad? And that he's trying to beautify you through it. You know, if you have that perspective on the seasons in your life, it will profoundly change the way you look at your life. You'll cast off this dualist way of thinking of everything as good and bad, and you'll see it as God just trying to beautify you and make you more into the image of his blessed son, Jesus Christ. I have a friend recently, a very close friend of mine, sent me a text early this morning. And the text said, Dennis, I am praying for you now, even this morning before the sunrise. Let me pause and say this. You need friends who will pray for you before the sunrise. And if you don't have friends that pray for you before the sunrise, get friends that pray for you before the sunrise. But, but he goes on to say, the very temperamental Martin Luther once wrote, the life, therefore, is not righteousness, but growth in righteousness. Not health, but healing. Not being, but becoming. Not rest, but exercise. We are not yet what we shall be, but we are growing toward it. What is Martin Luther saying here? Well, he's saying, in other words, that we are being beautified by the Lord. Paul says it a little bit different in Romans 8, 28. To the one who loves God, all things work together for good. The word good there and the word beautiful has the same uh, expression. It means it means fitting, that which is fitting for use. That which is made good for use. That's what beautiful is. And so as you look at your life, you might say, well, Dennis, I don't feel like so much good has happened to me. I know. I know. I have those seasons in my life, too. But what has been a blessing to me is to be reminded that I am in a beautification process. And that one day I will be presented faultless before the throne of grace. That's the hope of the gospel, by the way. That one day you and I 
will stand before God without spot or wrinkle because we have been made beautiful by the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah for the beautification work of the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? Do you look at your life like that? Notice the second point I want to make is this. God limits our understanding of the present that we might look to eternity or look to him for answers. Notice with me in verse number 11. He said he has made everything beautiful in its time. And then he says also he has put eternity into man, man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. He has put eternity in our hearts. He's placed eternity in you and I, in our hearts. That's what Solomon is saying here. You know, I remember the first time I realized that God has placed eternity in my heart. I was about nine or ten years old. I was a little boy in the Bahamas, barefoot, on the ground, playing in the dirt. And, and I remember as I was playing in the dirt, um, I began to think about eternity. I thought to myself, well, I know what a day is. I know what a month is. I know what a year is. I know what a century is. But then I began to think about eternity. And I, I remember I got a panic attack. I did. I started freaking out. And I remember running inside my house, and I grabbed a, a paper bag, because I read somewhere that if you're having a panic attack, you need to breathe into a paper bag. And so I started breathing in and out of a paper bag to try to get myself and pull myself together. But the immensity of thinking about eternity just grabbed a hold of my heart to the point where I couldn't fathom it. And, and what Solomon is saying here is that each and every one of us inside you today, God has placed eternity in our hearts, and, and we react differently to it. I had a panic attack. Well, as you're sitting there today, think about it. Do you know that God has placed eternity into your heart? Calvin calls it the sensus divinitatis, the sense of God, the sense that mortals like us have immortality placed in us, and we can't understand it. And it creates a cognitive disconnect in each and every one of us in here today. Do you know that eternity has been placed in your heart. That's what Solomon is getting at here. Now let me say this. One of the great frustrations in life is that man is limited in their understanding. It's one of the greatest frustrations in life. That's why uh, if you're ever on a road trip with children, they're always asking you, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Why? Because they need to know. And it's frustrating when you and I don't know. We get angry. All of us do. Because it's disorienting. Paul said it best. He said, the Jews demand a sign. Why do the Jews demand a sign? Because they want to know. Why do the Greeks seek wisdom? Because they want to know. Why did the Romans spend so much time on logic and rhetoric? Because they wanted to know. During the Enlightenment, why did they spend so much time on reason and individualism? Because they wanted to know. And in the 21st century, what is our greatest need? Why do we have Google and so many books? Why does the majority of our population want to go to college? It's because we want to know. And when we don't know, we get frustrated. I remember um, being in Pensacola, and I, I used to go to a retirement home. And, and I went to the retirement home, and I, I was sitting with some of the people that went to our church, and, and they were, were talking uh, to me. And a man walks up to me, an older man, and he says, hello. We'll call him John. He says, my name is John. I'm a homosexual. I am a liberal Democrat, and I hate religion. I said, great, have a seat. Let's talk. And so John, who is highly educated, said that he rejected Christianity a long time ago because uh, to him, 
Christianity was nonsensical. And I remember he gave me a list of things, or a list of reasons why he rejected Christianity, but three stood out, and here they are. He said the first is the problem of evil. Why would a good God allow people to suffer? And he told me a story of uh, children who were molested repeatedly, and no one did anything about it, and he just couldn't understand why God would allow that to happen. And the second one was God's sovereignty and man's free will. He said, why is it that God would hold me culpable for my sins if he is sovereign and can stop it? And then the third question, he said, he didn't understand why God would allow people to go to hell for all eternity if they only sinned for 70 years. These were all the questions that he asked. And he said he rejected Christianity because he never got a good answer for it. Now, he and I talked about all three of these and so much more. But his, his reasons are simply this. He rejected Christianity. He rejected God because he didn't understand the purposes of God in the here and now. And so he got frustrated at God. Because he said to himself that God was acting without cause. Without cause. That God didn't have a reason for why he is doing these things. That, that God is acting and limiting our knowledge just to punish us. And as I talked to him and tried to tell him that's not the case, he refused. You know what I've realized in my short time being a pastor and talking to people that there's many people, and you know them, that get angry and frustrated at God because they don't understand. And maybe you are inside here today, and you are the same way. You're dealing with sickness, and you don't understand why God is allowing you to go through that sickness. Or you have children who don't know Christ, and you're wondering why I've faithfully served Christ, and I have children that don't believe, or you were sexually abused, or you know others that were, and there seems to be no justice for that, or you suffer from sickness and depression, and you wonder why, why is it that God is allowing me to go through this, or you've suffered separation from a spouse, or, or divorce, or your parents might be getting a divorce. There's all sorts of reasons why you and I get angry at God. Because we think God is acting without cause. I had a professor who called it henum moments. The Hebrew word henum means without reason. It's found in Job chapter 2, verse uh, 3, in which uh, Satan comes to God and says, uh, God, uh, can I punish Job? And Job? And God says to Satan, why are you acting this way without cause? Job is a perfect man. There are many of us inside you today feel like Job, where God is punishing us or punishing the people around us without cause. Because we don't understand what God is doing. And so we attack God. Well, I, I think the people that understand this aspect of Henam, of God acting without cause seemingly are the African slaves in America from 17th century to 19th century. It's amazing that in the midst of many Henham moments they experienced, tragic moments in which they felt that God was acting without cause, they didn't try to find the answer to that problem on this earth. They reached for eternity. You said, Pastor, what do you mean? Have you ever read through the Negro spirituals? I'll give you some of the lines from them. The first one is wade in the water. It's a popular one. Probably many of you have sung it. Or how about come by here, my Lord. Or swing low, sweet chariot. Or it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Or the one that our children sing quite a bit. He's got the whole world in his hands. What do you notice about all those songs? With their lack of education, instead of trying to unscrew the inscrutable, they reached for eternity. Because they understand that 
God limits our understanding of this world for that very reason. The answer to the problem isn't found in the here and now. You have to stretch beyond the here and now to eternity, and that's exactly what they did. They reached for eternity. You know, the hubris of the modern man is seen in the reality that we insist on knowing everything. We have to know. We have to discern. We have to understand now. But don't you realize that God on purpose limits your understanding of the present so that you will flee and run to eternity? Because in the midst of henna moments, there's nothing else we can do but reach for eternity. That's what he means by he puts eternity in our hearts. He's not doing it to frustrate us or to anger us so that we might reach with eternity. Now let me end with some good news. The good news is we don't have to reach far for eternity. Because when I read my Bible, eternity came to us. The word of God says that Jesus Christ came and tabernacled with us. And he did this at the right time. And as I read this passage, I'm reminded that Jesus experienced a time to be born and a time to die. That he experienced times of weeping and laughing, mourning and dancing. That he experienced times where he kept silent and yet were called to speak. That he experienced times of love and hate, war and peace. The glorious reality of the gospel is this. Eternity has stepped into time, and you and I are better off for it. That the glorious wonder of the gospel is that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, at the right time, stepped into time, not just to be an exemplar for us, but for our atonement. And that you and I, in the midst of any season we're going through, don't have to live in despair. Eternal life is now. Right now, you could experience eternal life. You don't have to wait for it because eternity has come. Paul reflected on this in Romans eleven thirty three, and he says, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable is his ways. What is Paul saying there? Paul says that I've looked at the world. And I've seen that there are certain things I cannot understand. And instead of having a panic attack, and instead of being angry and frustrated at God, it leads me to worship Him. Leads me to worship Him. So what's my big takeaway for you today? Well, in the midst of whatever season you might be going through, learn to worship. Learn to thank the Lord for each season. Yes, I know some seasons are more uncomfortable than others. Some seasons are more difficult than others. Some seasons are less understandable than others, but all are working together for the good. Do you believe that? I urge you to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the reality of the gospel. Each and every one of us inside here today are going through various seasons in our lives. Seasons of transition. Seasons of frustration. Seasons where we don't know whether we're going or coming. Lord, thank you that you you limit us. You limit our understanding of the seasons. I thank you that you limit our sovereignty and our ability within each season, also that we can turn to you. Lord, bless us now. May we reach for eternity and be reminded of Christ, to be reminded of the gospel, that eternity did come, and now we can rest. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.